Hello. What is up? What's going on? Just hanging out with you. Awesome. I'm you and to catch up. Yeah, same. Great. Well, my name is Sharon. For is Sharon Zavani Zavian. I am currently wearing a black shirt with my hair pulled back. I have green inks, pink lipstick, and my background is white with a curtain on my left hand side that is yellow with a white design. Hi, I'm Ryan Giovanni, and I'm a male. I'm white. I have a blue jacket on with a blue lanyard, brown hair, brown eyes. And right now I'm in my office with a lot of different cubicles and airplanes, pictures of airplanes from Alaska Airlines. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Epstein. I am wearing a red shirt. And this is my sign name. It's an M on the left hand side of my forehead. I'm in my office with various books behind me and some art, what, artwork on the wall. <clears throat> I have auburn colored hair uh, and clear glasses on as well as a shaved beard. All right, this is Sharon talking. And I've been looking forward to having this discussion with all of you to talk about working in a hearing environment, our experiences, the challenges we've had. It's all been different for each of us. So I wanted to talk about it. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background for where I work. I work at the DEA, which is the Drug Enforcement Administration. And my role there is a forensic chemist. And so I do evidence analysis, pretty much. What do you guys do? That's fascinating. Um, so this is Ryan speaking. I work for Alaskan Airlines as a senior analyst in the strategic crew planning department. So I am responsible for all of the staff coordination for airlines and pilots. Let's say there's a flight cancellation. Unfortunately, that's under my scope. So sorry, sorry about that. This is Michael speaking. I'm a graphic design director. I'm part of the Art Directors Guild. And what I do is I design graphic for TV, graphics for TV and movies, movies here in Hollywood. This is Sharon speaking. Wow, you guys have some really cool jobs. Um, and I'm sure that among the three of us, people think getting this job, our jobs was easy, right? But it's not. It was a challenge. No, this is Ryan speaking. It definitely was a challenge, especially in aviation. It's not very commonplace to see a deaf person working. And there's that mindset, really. And the reason before that is because military pilots would train to become pilots. And most of the staff who work there have an old mindset that deaf people can't do it. But I have to tell them deaf people could do anything. And, you know, deaf people can fly small private airplanes. So I have to keep telling them that deaf people could do whatever they want. Michael, do you have any thoughts? Sure. So this is Michael speaking. And, you know, when I think about my industry, <clears throat> there are a lot of diversity issues across the board, including disability access, including deaf. So one challenge I face in my industry is freelance shows and freelance performances. Um, so I'm constantly meeting new people, constantly meeting, um, working in new offices, and I've had to develop systems or I've had to work with various folks, um, hopefully long term, but oftentimes on a and sometimes I face access issues, communication issues. Um, so that's just the, the nature of it. It's not as stable as a corporate environment, but I do enjoy my job. And that's something that I just have to deal with. This is Sharon speaking. I just wanted to share my experience that I've had with my job. And at first, when I applied, I went through the whole application process and I was denied because I was deaf. And they actually said, you don't meet the medical standards that we had. They actually said that phrase. And so I said, okay, all right, you know what? I'm just gonna have to be persistent and fight for this. And I finally ended up getting this job, but that journey was definitely not easy going through it. Absolutely. So this is Ryan speaking. I think my situation was a bit unique. I was a student at Gallaudet University and I took an internship with Continental Airlines. 
Um, this was in collaboration with NTID as well. So with that, in, or United rather, it was in collaboration with United. So I graduated from Gallaudet University. And from that internship, I had an opportunity to get my foot in the door, but I still had to interview 35 times after graduation because people would not hire me because of my deafness. So it was a challenge. Um, and I would often ask for feedback after interviews. I would ask to improve on my applications. And a lot of times the feedback I received was, you did great, but obviously they were seeing this and it was a challenge to overcome. So I networked with individuals in HR um, and I, I understood that they had this fear that because I'm deaf, they didn't know how to provide those accommodations. So I explained what those accommodations could be, potentially CART, potentially interpreters, potentially nothing. Um, but I had to lead that conversation rather than allow them to make assumptions. Um, and that's where I got where I am. This is Michael speaking for freelance work. I had to I have to interview for a job two times or three times a year. And so I have to go through that process a lot. And I have to develop my own strategies and my own ways that I can navigate through all of that. And one thing that I have typically done and is I'll just say, you know, I don't tell them I'm deaf. I just wait till they already communicated through email or they've already seen my portfolio online or they've seen my references. And from there, they already know that I'm established and I'm good at what I do. And I already have that trust built. And then from there, I show up in person and I can lip read and I navigate through that just to show them I can meet you in the middle. And it's not a hundred percent one way street, but we could definitely meet in the middle. I do some work, you do some work and we'll just work together to resolve this. So that's something that I do. And I know it's uh, ethically uh, eh, maybe a little bit dubious to, you know, maybe tell a lie, but sometimes, you know, you have to be, you know, selfish sometimes. I got to do what I need to do to make that happen for me. And so I go into an interview and I know that I don't represent the entire deaf community. I'm there for myself. I'm there to get a job myself. So if I need to speak, then I'll do that if I need to. If I need to wear hearing aids, I'll do it if I need to. And I'll do whatever it takes. And to make it clear that this accommodation is for me specifically, but I don't represent other deaf people. So other deaf people that I work with, or the people that I work with for a long time, they know that. So hopefully they've been exposed to me. So now they're going to hire other deaf people in the future and they're going to have other needs than I will, but at least they've had some exposure to the deaf community, which helps progress some. This is Sharon speaking. That's spot on. People think, you know, deafness and hearing um, communities are, are on par, but really we have to work harder regardless. So for example, at my job, I was initially turned down. So I wrote a letter and I even talked about bringing in a lawyer. I looked into the ADA. I contacted the EEO office. I had to put up a real fight to work against these barriers because I was for this type of job. Um, it had nothing to do with hearing. I worked hard every day and I still work hard, but I had to advocate for myself. Because we have other things in place, but ultimately we do still have to, to fight this battle every day. So out of curiosity, on a day-to-day -day basis, what accommodations do you typically work with in your workplace? That's a good question. This is Ryan. I think it's kind of interesting because most of the time, oh, this is Ryan speaking. I know most of the time, deaf people, we don't really look disabled. You know what I mean? People say, oh, you don't look disabled, but really we have a hidden disability. So until we actually meet a hearing person and that's where the disability pops up and surprise, we can't communicate. And so because we're deaf, we need a sign language interpreters. So I typically need interpreters for meetings, presentations, or monthly staff meetings, or any type of video meeting. So that's a nice thing about technology these days. It's so easy to get an interpreter for virtual Zoom meetings, and that makes it so much easier to work from home, you know, so we can have that work-life balance. But I know other people need more specific accommodations, and I always advise them. I tell everyone, I said, hey, just have a conversation with your manager. Just sit down with your leadership and just let them know what you need or your supervisor and see if they'll give you the support. And if they're not going to be advocating for you, then there will be more challenges down the line. So it's really important for upfront, if you're going to a new comp 
company to have that conversation so they know who you are and that way they feel more invested back in you. And that accommodation, you know, is not just for you, but it's for everyone to be able to communicate effectively together. And so that's one thing that I really try to tell people. But Michael? This is Michael here. I absolutely agree. And what I think is, so I think of life as pre-COVID and kind of after COVID. So pre-COVID, everything was in person. There were no masks. There were no problems with lip reading for me. But then when we came back into the world with masks, it was really difficult to lip read. Um, And we had side meetings and everything was on Zoom. So I could see people's faces and people were required to speak one at a time. Whereas in person, there was a lot of overlap in conversation. So I was able to kind of track a bit better. We had auto captioning, and we would bring in interpreters. So for me, there were some improvements for accessibility in Hollywood during this time um, because we learned that there were new ways to do this and there were some benefits. But I also agree that it's important to be upfront about what your accessibility needs are um, because you don't want those issues to come up in the long term or in the future. And at this point in time, my new show, I wrote a short message with my name that I'm deaf, explaining a few pieces about myself. I asked for patience and I posted that on my door. So people will often come in having already read that, knowing that I'm deaf. And I'm really fortunate that I've worked with some of these folks for a long time. So we've developed our own way of communicating, whether it be Gchat or texting or through email, even though we're all in the same physical office, we just text and communicate in that way pretty frequently. That's pretty helpful. And this is Ryan. I was just wondering, I noticed you mentioned it's really important to have that relationship with people when you introduce yourself, just to allow them to get to know you and have that opportunity to interact. And I feel that kind of helps reduce the awkwardness, you know, because most hearing people have never met a deaf person or a specific person with a disability before. So it's the first time. And when we're not sure about something, we're afraid and we're not, we're not really sure we want to approach and we want to retreat. So I know you mentioned that. And in my experiences with my coworkers in the office, I always let them get to know the true me. I love traveling a lot and I work for an airline company. So it's really easy for me to start that conversation of where do you like to travel and just build that connection and that relationship. So I think it's really important for us to figure out that common ground and let them know that, yeah, I'm deaf, you're hearing or whatever the case is, but we're the same. We have these commonalities, we're people, we work together. So it's really important to have that relationship with people. And Sharon, I was wondering what you think. Right, absolutely. Sure, I'm speaking. And, you know, I'm thinking about my own experience in the workplace and accessibility, communication as a whole, and my needs. I remember when I first got this job, I started at my lab in New York, and I had a manager, a supervisor. They were all ready to work with me. They were all eager and friendly. And honestly, was helpful living in New York, there was a lot of exposure Um, We also had social media and various technologies. So admittedly, uh, they did say this is kind of the first time that they've seen a deaf person in a lab. And this was the first time that they've had a deaf chemist at the DEA. So I knew I was safe. um, And I knew that this would be a journey that took a lot of work, but I was happy to be there and I was ready to do the work. So for meetings, I just advocated for my needs. I impressed upon the need for interpreters. Entities look for the cheapest interpreters. I had to educate on the quality of interpreters, finding qualified interpreters, hiring note takers for specific meetings, because I need to know these details for my job. I need to have access for, for my job. And when I first started you know, I, this was 2020, it was around the same time as COVID. I had an in-depth uh, lab training that was very intensive. And usually we would have an int- social distancing. So the- we had a lot of different ideas and I know the, the we would just have the interpreter who's live stay home And we told them we're going to have, they had federal interpreters ready on the iPads, on the computer, the iPhones. There were so many different devices that we could use. And that was one of the many ways that we could communicate. And I do remember asking them, 
hey, can we use that big words app so that'd be really easy for us to text back and forth. And they were so motivated to learn American Sign Language. And so there was different resources that we shared with them, Instagram, YouTube, classes online. And to make a long story short, the overall experience was extremely positive. And I have to say that I am grateful. So just looking back, it was it was definitely amazing. This is Michael speaking. So I grew up in a largely hearing environment. I was mainstream and I had already developed some techniques to interact with hearing individuals from an early age. So when I was in a hearing workplace, you know, I'm deaf obviously, but I was accustomed to accommodating for their needs and figuring out what I needed for myself. And so I would love to have the experience that you had access to interpreters and other resources. However, when I first started, I was in PA positions, which are entry-level positions. They don't provide interpreters or accommodations in that type of environment. So I had to really work my way up. And now in the position that I'm in, I say I need interpreters and they say, well, you haven't had one for five years. So what has changed? So I'm kind of stuck in this place where I have to set boundaries, set precedent and advocate um, in that type of environment. And I do speak, uh, however, it's just been a different experience. It's been a different form of language use for me. This is Ryan speaking. I think it's kind of interesting because I know Sharon went to the Lexington School for the Deaf and Michael, you grew up mainstreamed and I grew up in the best of both worlds. I had a deaf family, but I was mainstreamed. And so I had that balanced approach. And I think that it's really interesting that you mentioned accommodations. And I always remind people that I'm the vice chair of our access, the business resource group in Alaska Airlines, and I focus on different disabilities. And I always tell people, you have to remember that accommodations is always evolving and our disability doesn't stay the same. So obviously we're always gonna be deaf for the rest of our lives, but some people who have hearing loss and it's gradual hearing loss, their accommodations are gonna change and their needs are gonna change. So I think maybe you could frame it that way. You say, yes, I speak, but I may need more accommodations to fit my situation right now. Or maybe you should, maybe I shouldn't say this, but my lift read skills are good because of COVID, but they are because, you know, after COVID was done, not done, it's still ongoing, but there's a lot more people that are not using masks and I'm very rusty. It's taking me a while to actually pick it back up again, but I can lip read again. I'm pretty good at it. So it's really interesting. But in my line of work, in my workplace, in the airline industry, it's very secure and safe because of COVID and of course with customer service and all the passengers have to use masks and all the deaf and hard of hearing passengers would complain. And I noticed a lot more people are willing to step up and write and make sure that there's full access to communication. And it's not perfect. There's still room for improvement, of course. So yeah, it's really interesting. This is Sharon speaking. You know, this has me thinking about a few things. We have had different skill sets and different experiences, but we're deaf regardless. So it really doesn't matter if we can hear or if we can speak. They should provide interpreters if this is what we need, regardless. This is Michael speaking. Yeah, I think it's true within the deaf community about language access and a lot of different accommodations that we need. Some people, you know, deaf people, so some deaf people don't know signs, so they may need live captioning. And there are other services that don't involve signs. So there's such diverse access needs under one umbrella when you call yourself deaf. And so I really think that going to the HR department where you work and telling them specifically, for me, these are the things that I'm going to need. Generally, deaf people may need this, but for me, this is what I need. And Ryan, didn't you say for your first interview that maybe they looked up in Google and they said, oh, this person needs an interpreter and they're expensive. And maybe they didn't know what was all involved and they might've freaked out because, and not even giving you a chance to speak for yourself and saying, hey, I'm going to need this and this and this, and just make yourself a little bit more clear. It's a difficult conversation to have, but it's really important to have. This is Ryan here. Absolutely. And looking at the job, I should have looked at the company. I looked looked at the vision and I looked at the culture and I should have seen, you know, whether or not this aligned with my own. You know, when I arrived there, not everything was perfect, but 
I just wanted to feel like a person. I, I didn't want to be a number. And I think sometimes you have to hide your disability just to be offered the interview. But from that point on, that's where the journey starts. And if the company refuses to provide those accommodations, sometimes they have to learn and maybe they'll take that opportunity to grow individually and as a company. But to face all of these barriers, you know, we're fighting to dismantle this. And I, I don't want to give up, but ultimately, do I want to work for that company? Do I want to work in a toxic environment if I'm not going to be seen or heard? Um, just thinking of, of how people think in general. This is Michael speaking, also acknowledging that different jobs are going to have different access to accommodations. So if you go to work in retail or a service industry, they're just your everyday life at work is going to be different than working at a corporate office. And so very true. It's really case by case. It's you know there's the three of us rep representing a small segment of the population, but there's so many other things that are happening too out there. But I think that I mean, you know, it's not we're not the only one. There's a lot of deaf people that have already tried everything. And if you want to try something new as far as a new job goes, there's deaf people that have already done that before too. So I mean, I don't think that you should think of it as there's no deaf people that have done this before me and that's a barrier. You just have to be creative in how you talk about it and how you get access. And you may have to work even harder to get in, but if you really are passionate about that, I think it's worth doing it. This is Sharon speaking. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I think some key points to take away from this is whether it's a company or an agency or your manager, are they open to learning? Are they open to working with us? Wonderful. Let's give them the resources. Let's educate. Let's work together. Um, and just out of curiosity, in your workplace, how do you get along with your coworkers? What do your relationships look like with your managers, your supervisors, and your colleagues? Do you ever feel left out? Do you ever feel, uh, you know, people will gather for lunch on a daily basis? Do you participate in that? Do you have relationships with your colleagues? This is Ryan speaking. So yeah, it's kind of interesting because, you know, as a corporate, as a corporate person working from home for the most part, I'm working for Alaska Airlines for about a year. I've been back to the office, not full time, but I'm still working for home from home two days a week. I've had the opportunity to meet my coworkers face to face until about six months ago. And then we started building that relationship and started knowing each other. And we have those team lunches and we go out. But there's still that lack of full access to communication because I'm not going to get an interpreter for everything. So when there's important meetings or presentation, that's, I mean, that's just my personal preference because I can lip read and I have a level of comfortability to interact with people. I don't feel like it's a challenge, but I do feel like I'm missing opportunities to show my culture and my language. It's a positive relationship, but I'm not completely satisfied. I'm curious about you and what your experiences are, Michael. This is Michael. I have a really similar experience. So I have some really great friends at work. And when we communicate one-on-one, -on -one, it's pretty fine. We can understand one another. However, group settings is pretty tough. It's tough. Every once in a while, we'll have a larger meeting or a famous person will come in, a celebrity will come to speak on something, and there will be stories about famous movies that they've worked on, et cetera, et cetera. And I just can't understand it at all. So it's difficult to relate to my job. Um, and I can't ask them to repeat what they've said over and over. So it's I have friends and I do have relationships with some friends at work. At the same time, I do feel very isolated and very left out pretty much all the time. So I go on set pretty often just to manage what's going on. And typically sets are dark and people use walkie talkies and radios to communicate, which is impossible to access anything while on set. So you have to whisper if you're hearing. I just try to avoid going to a space where I can't access what's going on. And that's my approach. Huh, this is Sharon speaking. That was definitely thinking about this. And I remember when I arrived at the lab as a new employee, there were team meetings. And what struck me was one of the people in the group was so motivated. Do you know the Ava app? Are you guys mm -hmm. familiar with that? Yes. 
they kept showing that to me and wanting to use it during the team meeting. And it really touched me so much. And it just, they use the Ava app. And of course, with those team meetings, it's really hard to use them. So I had to explain to them for team meetings or any kind of events, for luncheons or people are getting together, it's definitely better to get an interpreter. But if you're just meeting together with a couple people or if I'm talking with my supervisor, then it's just great. And we formed a great relationship. Some of the people that I work with have been even motivated to learn sign and they'll be like, oh, look at this. And they'll show me different things on the app and they just make it fun to learn. Plus my supervisor is taking classes online and sometimes they go up to me and they say, oh, this is dog, this is pizza, this is spaghetti. And they just show me how excited they are. And so I've been teaching them more and they're signing and they're picking up different things. And of course, in the scientific field, we have a lot of jargon that we use. And so we typically use the computer to type back and forth. And at my lab, there's a fume hood. Do you know what that is? It's the glass that we use. And so we typically write on that. And it is just a great way to communicate. So my relationship that I've had with all my coworkers have been extremely positive. And we've shared the same interests. For example, I love, I have some friends I love CrossFit and I have some friends that have joined me for CrossFit competitions and we get together and it's just, it's been great. Honestly, honestly, I have to be, if I'm to be honest with you, if I want to say that I feel like I fit in every single day, I, it's, I don't, I don't. So I remember, you know, I just see some people cutting up in the hallway and they're just talking and. I don't know what they're saying. And so I have to come up to them and I have to ask them or they'll look at me and they'll say, oh, the, you're here. Okay, okay, let me fill you in. And my coworkers will do that. You know, some of my friends will do that. They'll nudge me and they'll say, I'll fill you in and they'll text me and let me know what's going on, which is really nice of her to do that. But yeah. This is Ryan speaking. So question for both of you, what tools would you find more helpful for us to feel more included at work? Because obviously with COVID, and prior to COVID, Teams, Zooms, those type of platforms weren't utilized. Um, so just thinking more so from a universal design and universal access point, what are some tools that we could utilize to improve access as a whole in the workplace? This is Sharon speaking. In a nutshell, just with everything that's going on, people will ask me, they'll say, okay, if you want to, can you give a presentation or some kind of training or explain what's going on? And I'll typically do that. And I'll give a presentation of how to communicate with me. I'll let them know how to communicate with me and all the different ways to communicate with me and all the resources that I have. And everyone's so eager and they'll say, oh, I like this information because now I know what to do. And of course, people are awkward when they first meet me because they've never seen a deaf person before, which is not their fault. So. Just like we said, it's all about teamwork. You know, we always have to be a little bit, the one to be a little bit assertive and make the first move. And if I learn something new, I always bring it to them. So for example, I went to NAD, um, Deaf in Government, DIG, and I definitely work with them and give them tools and resources about those groups. And I ask them for resources and the different things I need. It's all about communication. We'll never know if we don't communicate. Communication is key, right? So really, it's all about communication. Absolutely. Shared. And I think ultimately your best tool that you have is yourself and your self-advocacy. Because truly, you do have to figure it out yourself. You have to have thick skin and you have to roll with it. And sometimes you just have to sit and observe a little bit and figure out how to best access everything and stand up for yourself. You're right. You have to be assertive. At the end of the day, they are hiring you specifically to work at that company, to work together and to create things or solve problems or whatever, but it's to be a part of the team. And you need to be able to access that environment. You need to be able to do all of those things to accomplish the group's goals. And that means they're going to have to include you in some way. And sometimes you're going to have to be assertive and say, hey, I'm here. You hired me to provide the service for you. And you're not giving me the tools that I need to provide my piece of this team or the group. And they need to respect that. And it's not easy. Absolutely. Sometimes it's not comfortable. With years of experience, you become better at it. 
And with more practice, you become more confident to stand up and just say no, or just say, mm-hmm. I need this, period, bottom line. And you'll become better at it. It'll become easier the more you practice. And the biggest tool you have is yourself and your confidence and your willingness to work hard. Absolutely. This is Ryan speaking. Honestly, you are amazing people. All of the deaf folks out there, you know, we're all working hard to elevate ourselves and elevate the community and show the world. Major, major props to all of you and big applause to all of you. This is Sharon. Yes, I'm glad we had this conversation at Hangouts and we definitely need to have this conversation more often and share ideas and stories and just support each other. Maybe we could have a, maybe there's a Facebook page for that, I think. But anyway, mm. this is great. Great. Well, this is Michael speaking. It looks like we're wrapping up for tonight. This was such a wonderful chat and I'll see y'all on the block. Take care. Bye.